So I'm going to talk about, um, I mean, what following from the last two speakers, actually, last few chats about um, how do you actually think at the molecular level, but then actually practically translate that in the lab? Because it's okay saying, you know, I'm going to make this molecule, put this nanotube somewhere, but if you can't practically do it, then it doesn't, you know, it's it's kind of just difficult. Like you say, with a crash test, you can build the car crash test, but I mean, simulate on builds a car. But if you put nanotube, on a on a graphene and then add a copper atom who does that well answer no one right it's not possible so we have to make sure the drawings we're doing are kind of um are reasonable so a few years ago i started to um invent a kind of domain specific programming language for chemistry that actually works in the lab right not like a, and i realized there's a gap because all these computer scientists are really good at building languages but they were not uh, actionable so it's a bit like um so um, it's kind of, kind of funny to go to my lab and say, right, can I control you guys because you're not reproducible? You don't do, don't do the same thing. It's your lab books aren't interoperable. How do I how do I make you guys more reproducible? So I kind of against the backdrop of the fact that you know chemistry is quite hard. That you can make lots of molecules. This is just a representation of chemical space. This is actually tax all being made. It's a nice little movie. But what I realized we had to do was to build a kind of machine that was programmable. And um, this kind of state, the synthesis state machine is literally a robot you tell the unit operations to do and it will just make the molecules, right? It's not a virtual tool um, that will just tell you if a molecule can exist, but you could imagine connecting them together, right? So how can you come up with the right procedure for making whatever drug? And so the scheme here just shows that you have some digital inputs you need to represent in some way. So you need some code. That code needs to then change the state of the machine. But really, it's not that complicated. If you look on the right-hand side, you can see a valve, a flask, a reactor, a hot plate. When you think about it, all chemistry is, and all bulk chemistry is, is add, heat, stir, right? It's actually, there could be other things, right? You could cool it down, you could add, add something, but actually, quintessentially, when you come to doing chemistry, a chem or any, or any material science, you do the reaction, followed by a workup, followed by an isolation and purification. That's all it is. It's complicated. There are some hard processes to be done out there. So is there a way to kind of, you know, go from, and I, and I, I hate AI because it's just like, it's like, it's just math, right? And I love math, but I hate people saying that AI is some kind of magic. It's not, it's just it's a regression. And if you've got data and you can regress on your data, you can get an outcome, right? That's what was made me. So, you know, I think we're on the same page there. So can you basically make a, a system that you can literally put in some a property and that property will be turned into a series of graphs and those graphs you then actually go into a lab and make it. You go literally from property to molecule. And this is some of the things we've done in the lab. Um, let me give you one example here. So this is a way of taking a procedure text from the literature, any, any synthesis procedure. So we go reaxis, we just take, some, take a molecule we wanna make, Take the code, the, the actual English input, then we put this into our model, which is a transformer model we use that converts. It's basically GPT for chemistry, but it doesn't just it doesn't predict what you're going to make next. It turns it into a code. And it turns it into a code that works in the robot. So the robot understands um, the code that you produce. That's really important. Um, so you have the reagents here, the workup, uh, and so on. And uh, so it obtains procedures. Give the results and then gives you the code. Actually, React IBM that has a competitor one, which I'll show you. It's a bit cheeky. Uh, so this is the actual code output, which looks very, you know, there's a lot of code there. There's a lot of um, instructions. This is the one you go. If you go IBM RxN, uh, you put all that in, and it comes and it tells you, uh, you get those four things out. And it's quite funny because obviously that doesn't run any robots. That's just IBM not really understanding how it connects computer science to chemistry lab. So let's take it a little bit further. Let's actually draw a molecule. So we're going to draw molecules in ChemDraw um, here. So I want to basically, can I make this molecule without going into the laboratory and getting my hands dirty at all? Okay. So we'll just draw the molecule, translate it, to put it into a smile. So we copy the smile, put it into our, our synthesis system. And then what it does, because we've already pre-trained the robot, we've physically done some chemistry, like making um, different classes of reactions. 
it doesn't just give you any scheme back. It only gives you the reaction scheme if it's done the reaction before, so it knows the process conditions generically. So that's what the, the uh, so you can see here, that basically it's broken it up into roots that we know, and we can do it with whole libraries of them as well. So you can take more molecules, put them in the system, and then just say, right, spit out the code that will work on the robot. Now, it doesn't do all the chemistry. What you have to do over time is just train the robot to do more and more chemistry. So there's about one and a half thousand reactions, I would think, in chemistry, like generic reactions classes. So you have to get the robot to do all of those and do 20 examples. And then this is where your tool would be really interesting if you could say predict solubilities, predict um, uh, um, thermodynamics, and say, oh, yeah, do those, you'll get an exotherm maybe, but call it down a bit. So, you know, so you have this kind of, so you can see you have all these libraries. So this is the outsourced output of the synthesis, what we call compute, computable roots. So this term computation is like, the word computer got made up by a reporter in 2012, and then I've used it to call it computer because it's quite a fun word, but actually, I realized that there, it, it, in computation, computation is the act of you know, writing an algorithm, standardizing on some hardware, running it on a Turing complete architecture, and put in a given algorithm, given data set, put them together, get the same output. So computation, um, robot with the right hardware, code, chemicals, same chemical out. It's really important that those things, there's a strict mapping between the two. Um, so there's a little video there of one of the, the very first computers running in the high speed, going through the four things. If you watch carefully, you'll see reaction, workup, isolation, and purification. And um, it's got a little bit more advanced in the system, but basically the programming language we developed is called KIDL, and it literally is add A to B, you know, weight, shake, heat, cool. There's nothing magic. It's not like some kind of very, very mysterious code. It's what a chemist would do in the lab. You know, there are some unit operations you have to figure out, you know, um, maybe the words are kind of complicated, but you break them down. So, and the, the, the scheme on the right is what we're, we're making at the moment in the company. So I've got kind of three things going on in the lab. I've got my research group that are just uh, doing the underpinning science. I've got a company called Chemify that's actually commercializing this. I'm also developing a standard, so the standards body, so the programming language gets out there. And soon you'll be able to download 100,000 KIDLs, 100,000 reactions, and be able to play with them, release them those. I'm validated, of course, because the company would kill me if I started giving away the right IP. Um, so to build the infrastructure, what you have to do is have make sure the programs are reproducible. So we've just actually, uh, uh, I think there's some of Dave, these people here, we've just made a molecular machine in our computer. So it's kind of cool. See, the, the league group does some quite cool chemistry. They make these molecular machines, right, with threading things. And I thought it'd be fun to actually have a robot, a machine that makes a molecular machine. And then the outcome from the chemistry, where they go, you know, depending on the pH or something, it then the robot reprograms itself as a function of what happens at the molecular level. So that's kind of cool. You want to then kind of have a GitLab for chemistry. I think that might be quite interesting, make things more safe, because then you know, you can then uh, scale things up by just numbering them up. Why would you have, why would you make lots of different manufacturing facilities if you could just have one standard robot and you just number it up? I think that's something that I'm trying to, a lot of, you know, the chap who was talking about earlier, probably does a lot larger scale chemistry, but if, you, if the global demand is in the order of kilograms or something, so some quantum dots, I think Samsung puts in their TVs, I don't think it's that much. It's not, it's not thousands of tons. It might be a metric ton. And you can make quite a lot of TV screens with that. So you could probably just make them, right? Just number up in the lab. Think about the cost of the pilot plant versus just a robot that can do any chemistry you want forever. You just clean it, you know, so just like quick fit glassware, but, but encodable. Um, so we want to do this to enable the chemical internet. What I'm going to do is I'll stop in a minute and then we talk to each other or whatever, make jokes. Um, I actually, I, I'm an inorganic chemist. So I, I used to did a lot of, crystallography and, and organic synthesis, inorganic synthesis during my PhD. So, um, so I like making fun of uh, synthetic chemists, not because I don't like them, but because I think I found that synthetic chemists used to keep a lot of secrets and in general, it wasn't possible to reproduce what they were putting in the literature, right? Yeah, so, so it would be good if we got those secrets out there. Um, DARPA gave me a load of money years ago because they, well, what happened, DARPA have these, these fun projects where um, they, there's a big like, uh, you know, challenge, like a self-driving car challenge or computer vision challenge. They did a one called Make It, which was make molecules. And 
my colleagues at MIT got like I don't know, millions of dollars, $25 million to build a robot that would make baclofen uh, um, in, in flow. And it would just do that one molecule. Whereas we made a 3D printed architecture or 3D printed reactor where you could make baclofen a little bit slower, only 70 milligrams of per, it would cost $1.50. <laughs> and so, the, and it was automated as well, but just you had the code to do it. And the the, the little movie you see there with the with the in the bottom right hand side with the three D printed robot, and then the thing on the side that's a mini computer that runs by Kydeo as well. And so, one of the things we're trying to do now is now you start knowing how to make things, then you can start to basically break things. I discover new things and work out how to put sensors on. So you, you start by not being able to make everything, and then start to explore everything, and then. These are all the robots we have in the lab right now. So one of my researchers, Abhishek, is he's he's seen a lot of these because he's been building the nanomaterials robot. So this is a little robot we have. Um, what it does, it has a. Oh, right, it's gonna the next version is cybernetic. I, I, the way I say it, like Abhishek, we'll have this robot that dreams of a nanoparticle by by basically solving the Schrodinger equation and giving you a UV bit, so color. So what color do you want? So it knows the color, and it takes takes all the reagents, mixes them together, says, are you the right color yet? You're right color yet, you're right color, it keeps going around. And we just published, I think the next version is in Science Advances a few weeks ago with a like 250 page SI where you could reproduce everything. And there's even KIDLs for those nanoparticles, right, as well. And then we're also making droplets because we're interested in making artificial life forms, which is one of the reasons I started to build robotics because we want to find out if aliens exist, believe it or not. And, um, yeah, and there's a real reason, you know, for having this standardization. But you can see in the bottom right corner, uh, down there, those droplets in a dish that have been looked up using image, using a video. And obviously, we're using image uh, re recognition techniques to kind of track the trajectories of the droplets and find out how these behave. Now, someone, I think the person's gone, was talking about, you know, not complex non covalent systems. Well, this is an example where it's probably easier to do the experiment and do the computation, but you can maybe compute what. Um, so fact and combinations you want to use what stabilizing material and probably um, um, kind of test it in real time. As I said, the reason we want to do it is we want to make a closed loop system. Literally, you, you know, you want to you want a round bottle flask where there's no life in it. You want to add in inorganic materials, um, shake it for about you know the equivalent of 100 million years, and a life form should come out. It's easy, right? That's what happened on Earth. I mean, it was a bigger round bottle flask, more stuff in it. But um, I'm, and I'm trying, we're trying to um, uh, kind of explore chemical space in that way. How do you know what you're looking for? Well, luckily, my good collaborating friend here, Sarah Walker, is the expert in, in what life is. But maybe you can answer that. Maybe. Sorry? Later. Later. <laughs> now, what we're looking for, I mean, um, is you, you're, we're literally putting simple stuff in, and we're developing a technique to using mass, uh, technical mass spectrometry to see when the molecules are getting more complex. Now, complexity doesn't happen for free, right? But computer scientists will tell you this very well, right? You get in what you, you, you tend to get out what you put in. But here's a big question in the origin of life. You got this simple stuff. How does this simple stuff make a, make a ribosome? So the, and there's the answer is selection and evolution. So how do you know when something is interesting? Well, you, you'll have these simple molecules. They will be depleted and the complexity of the molecules will go up. And then that's the process we need to look at. So it's uh, pretty exciting because it's so bloody obvious. Um, we did, no one's doing experiments. You need to put some sand in a round bottle glass and basically some clays, minerals, very simple organics, do the reaction, recycle, 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 and then uh, eventually a life form will come out. You've already found something, haven't you? No, but we exist. Uh, uh, so it, and that's what happened on planet Earth. Unless you believe in um, divine creator, or I don't know the fact that we that we came we're seeded from life elsewhere. Then it had to happen very simply. So it was just a bunch of physical inorganic processes. I'm an inorganic chemist, and uh, yeah, and we called this alpha soup zero to take make make take this out. And don't get me wrong, this, this these 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 tools are fantastic. Uh, as you were saying earlier, the tools are brilliant. When the problem is solved, just use it again. If it's a very well defined problem, like you know, optical character recognition or speech recognition, but why do it again? Just use the code. Um, what I'm arguing about with, say, AlphaFold is that um, it doesn't do all the proteins and people in science are starting to assume it's a done pro solve problems. They're not going to give research funds out to people who want to do weird protein structures, say, oh, AlphaFold can do it. That's pretty dangerous. 
So, and but there's nothing getting, you know, alcohol is a great tool. Regression is a great tool. I like numbers, they work. You can map them. Yeah. So yeah, so the idea here is with alpha, the, the idea of alpha go is you didn't tell the rules. So so here with alpha soup zero, you don't you don't have the rules of chemistry, you don't have the rules of biology, you say mix loads of stuff together and doesn't make anything come out. Hmm. That's nice. Yeah, hopefully it'll happen. Life doesn't have rules, does it? Well, we invent the rules. I mean, you know, I don't, yeah. Yeah, 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 sure. of course. How, how do you uh, control the time parameter uh, so that you don't have to wait for 100 million years? <laughs> So that's the so the idea is um, um, in the end well chemistry first there's two, there's two two answers there's three or four answers there, actually the first answer is that um, chemistry occurs on a very fast time scale it doesn't tend to you don't tend to do chemistry over hundreds of millions of years right and that that's what evolution tends to do so we're hopeful that we'll see some of the underlying selection very quickly the second answer as you can see they're not one round bottle flask but there are four. So you can imagine having a matrix of these with different plays, different environments where you can put the chemicals and maximize the exposure to different um, features. So um, uh, Abhishek and Sarah and I all actually work on the theory and the teams where we've realized that the, if you take simple molecules, you put them in very different environments. The more different environments, the env different environment prints its, diff its otherness, if you like, or difference on those molecules. And by mixing them together, you make you make very novel systems, and that's what we're beginning to see. So that's a multiplexing and a fat chemistry is fast. And what we can do is we can cheat, right? There's a whole point is we don't have a planet, we don't have 100 billion years. My my PhD students would kind of get annoyed if I told them their PhD is 100 billion years. Um, but we use the automation, and then we're going to use obviously control automation um, and some simulation to help us. Who's funding this? Um, so at the beginning, I think of funding, right? So I, I kind of I wrote a load of grants to basically, you know, build a gigantic machine to crack origin of life, and everyone said no. So I then um, wrote the grants to do inorganic dis materials discovery because I'm an inorganic chemist. Inorganic chemists tend to be quite nice, and they gave me a load of money because I, I the organic chemists hate hated this at the beginning. They all said it was what, not going to work. It was it's stupid. You know, making it up. You know, so most of them still do, but. Um, so it's a combination of European Union, um, well, they used to, sadly. Anyway, that's not all right. They removed their money. But uh, yeah, so yeah. EPSRC, DARPA, and, e and now the Origin of Life stuff, the Templeton. Mm -hmm. So Sarah and I have another bunch of grants from the Templeton Foundation, it's been really good. And what's in it for them? The like Templeton? Why? Oh, well, what? Like why? Yeah, yeah, so that's a really important question. Why do this type of research? Well, mm -hmm. I think, well, they're, they're, the Templeton are very used to um, um, find, um, <coughs> funding research is philosophically deep as well as technologically meaningful, right? So why do we care about making aliens in the lab? And it's a genuine question. Well, we want to know what is the general principles gives rise to life? What is life? This is a very good question a lot of people are working on. Second question, what is the likelihood of finding life in the universe? We've got the James Webb telescope. Um, if we make life in the lab, then we might be able to guess what type of planet to simulate. So, you know, you're thinking too small. Right, you should make what, your Samsung planetary version, right? It's like yeah. planet simulators, like Maybe have a planet. That's next year. <laughs> yes, that's, right? That's the next year of yeah, yeah. So then you say, where are you going to look for life and what, what, what is it likely going to be? And also, it's going to tell us what is the future of life on Earth going to be like, human life, right? Because um, one of the interesting things, if you can see that we're doing through chemical evolution, you go from your soup to the first kind of rudimentary living system, whatever that is. Let's just go, let's just take our biology, go all the way back. Um, and let's say that, you know, there was a transition to RNA, DNA, and the ribosome. Now we're on this trajectory, ask yourself, what is the, you know, uh, what is the plants going to be doing in a billion years? What type of molecules can be produced? There's already an evolutionary tree, there's already a trajectory, right? The, this question is actually that Sarah, myself, and my teams, were, our teams were trying to answer to try make new opiates mm -hmm. for the NIH. And to make ones that are addiction free that could still um, um, be good pain med medication. There's a shit ton of problems with opiates, obviously, in, in the US and UK, with people addicted and uh, all, the, all the tragedy that comes from addiction. So I thought, oh, well, let's just, and Matt did the four experiment, FAF, evolve life forward a billion years, what does it look like? Well, it's not going to reinvent everything because you have contingency, right? The technology, the protein. So that's another reason for doing it. So basically, are we alone? 
do we really exist and what's going to happen? Mm. They're some of the most profound questions we need to answer, I think. Uh, that's why we're doing it. So Lee, when we think about the primordial soup, we think about extreme temperatures, extreme like discharges charges and stuff. And in your setup, you probably don't have that. So how, how are you going to, to overcome, make, is that a fundamental limitation or? or? Uh, no, not really. So at the moment we are cheap, well, we are doing it in glassware. So you would go up to maybe five bar maximum, you don't want to put glass to explode, maybe 10 bar. You can go up to a couple hundred degrees. Um, but um, are you exploring producing? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, the, so, the, so we so we're being kind of lazy right now. Well, we have collaborators with, with Sarah's collaborators as well. We basically used to do really high pressure, high temperature chemistry under geologically reasonable conditions. So you know, several hundred bar um, supercritical CO two things like that. You could play around supercritical water. So we're going to explore there as well. But I don't think you need it. Here's the thing. If you go too high in temperature, you're going to break the bond. And if you break the bond, or break bonds in general, you are going to remove um, um, information about the, the selection of before evolution. So you, so you want to be automatically accelerate the chemistry, but not erase the heterogeneity. So my, you know, my fun kind of take on life is it's just the universe making a memory, right? And that memory is made in chemistry. That's the, I mean, I'm a chemist, I'm pretty boring. All I know how to do is make bonds, and I'm not even very good at that, but luckily my team are better. Um, so I think that the, the, so you want to accelerate the formation of those bonds, but it's not a, the, 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 the flip side is that you can actually destroy a lot of interesting molecules. But yeah, so I, it, it's, uh, so in the system right now, what we've got, I mean, I'm sure what we've got programmable photochemistry, electrochemistry, high pressure, microwave, um, we've even got spark discharge, so milliuri type conditions, um, but we're just making modules, you can all put them together and they can all be programmed using KIDL as well. So like, I'm like, you may have put KIDL ibuprofen, KIDL RNA, whatever sequence, KIDL lipo, that'll be the... <laughs> and it was just me. Yeah, and let me make a suggestion that has to do with what I do. I, I would <coughs> suggest that you might also consider a controlling for magnetic fields. Yeah, we can put magnetic fields in there. I mean, the problem, the thing is, the magnetic field is quite weak, right? And so, and also, so you just got to work out under the reaction conditions what's going to couple and what's going to give you. If you, know, if you could come to my talk in the afternoon, I'll, I'll try to convince you that the magnetic field of the Earth is essential to sustain life. Sure, but it is because it could, well, I mean, for the reason I know is it would help us deflect charged particles at the surface. But, no, no. but yeah, but you'd have to, you can have to make the case by showing, yeah. uh, showing evidence that the reactions are influenced by the magnetic field. That has not yet, to my knowledge, been demonstrated. No, it hasn't. I mean, uh, unless you've done it, you haven't published it yet. I'm up to speed in the literature. There's lots and lots of small indications, but they're not reproducible. Uh, well, there it's, are, it's been known uh, in radical chemistry that uh, there are spin dependent chemical reactions. Yeah, yeah, but that's, that's not what you just said. So, yeah, that's a bit. Anyway, we'll, we'll, I'll come to your talk. We can talk about your talk in awesome. your talk. But yes, can you put a radical on that magnetic field and do chemistry with it? Yeah, sure. But does that happen on the scale of the planet? It hasn't been proven. We should agree to disagree with Well, no, but show me the data then. I'm, like, I'm not I magic. I'm not a magician. If you have the data, then yes. it's fine. Yeah, sorry. Why, why do you think, like, fundamentally that? Life has to emerge. Like the universe can be stopped, but a uh, few chemicals be in equilibrium with each other. No? If you put some chemicals in, like in a car, and you give all the conditions, but let it be in equilibrium and just done that forever. Why do you think there is a drive to be complex and complex and complex? So, I will see you, okay. Well, it can be uh, like in. in a, you're, yeah. saying, you're saying, does it have to happen or why did it happen? And does it have to happen? Like, oh, is it like a problem? No, I mean, the moon, the, the, the moon. Do you believe that life will be? I don't believe in anything. I just I just do data, right? So the moon is quite dead. Yeah. So nothing happened on the moon. So what what happened to the moon? Well, the moon has no it it, it doesn't have very much heterogeneity. There's not much um, of, a, of a of a chemical potential gradient. So obviously you need energy sources. You need what sources of materials. You need the right gravitational constant. So it doesn't have to happen. But it, when the conditions are right, it will happen. And so and it did happen on Earth, right? So if it happened on Earth, it can happen elsewhere. But, so that's yeah, you know, yeah. the sure. logic. It's a, it's a but, probability. but, 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 there's so many unknowns. And so what's left out? What do you think you could have left out? Well, that's why we're doing the experiment, right? Mm -hmm. So if we do the experiment, I mean, I, 
at the moment, I'm just saying. How are you identifying them? Yeah, no. Well, well, so well, hang on. Hang on. One of the anonymous teams, but it, 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 it was changing all of the time. So we have a thesis well, which is testable. And the, te the thesis is that we will get more complex molecules out by doing recursive chemistry, and they will start building genetic systems. And we're testing that right now. And if it doesn't work, we'll then change the parameters. I mean, what? Yeah, th there's lots of unknowns. Yeah. So I would have a question. You talk about selectivity, but. Um, what if serendipity, do you think serendipity ever played a role in serendipity? Yeah, yeah, sure, sure. And how can you reproduce, can, how can you take that into account serendipity when you Well, what, what do you mean, what do you mean, so what like I mean chess, by... Like chess, like chess, like it's yeah, yeah, not hang just more interesting. Yeah, yeah, hang on, hang on, hang on, we've got to, let's just talk, what chess, no, chess is just now, it's just like, serendipity, what is serendipity? Let's define it. So what you mean is you mean heterogeneity. So serendipity is literally um, a chance happening, right? So if you've got a large, and this is kind of what you're getting at, if you have a very large set of different minerals in different environments, moving the chemicals through different environments will increase the chance that you'll start to get selection occurring. When you get selection, that gets amplified to get to evolution. So I totally agree with you, but disagree with you. Serendipity is not magic. It's just selection in random environments that are then tried. Those random events have to be somehow become contingent. When they become contingent, off you go. So yes, I agree, but selection, but yeah, novelty. I mean, chess. I, I'm using chess for job discovery at the moment, actually, which is kind of fun. But it's just a game, and it's a game made by humans. Yeah. What do you think causes selection in the natural environment? Just uh, that's, 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 the, that's the that's the question. So basically, different reaction rates is kinetics. So basically, if you have two different objects that happen to catalyze one reaction over another, you just one is able to select one molecule over another. That's all it is. There was a, in Kevin Kelly's book, What Technology Wants, just from a few years ago, I think he makes the case that, uh, like, it's supposed to be just entropy, which favors replicators because it creates. Yeah, no, that's nonsense. The entropy that's doesn't, it's like, well, uh, again, like, these people write these books and they just make stuff up. So, no, it's much more this. <laughs> entropy is a, it, so they're almost right, right? But then they're, they're basically wrong. So, what you really need to look for is not a, entropy, but, um, um, evidence of selection. And evidence of selection comes in information, it comes in assemblies. The problem with entropy, you can miss selection with, entro with entropy because you just see, entropy just tells you what you didn't know. Well, it tells you you've lost something, it doesn't tell what you lost. So you're almost, it, he's almost right, like so many people, they're almost right. How to do the experiment? There's usually an issue with that because of the way they define macro states, so it's easy to make it look like entropy is increasing, defining, yeah. independent, define your boundaries of what you define as a replicator. It's probably coming from Jeremy and his work, but I don't yeah. know, like, I think it's just a similar mechanics. Yeah, Jeremy's... Like, yeah, it's mathematically not just nonsense. It's like a circular loop. It's, it's not, it's not, it is circular. So, yeah, but yeah, but, it, but you're interested in the right thing. But I would say it's more structure complexity, yeah. This may be a bit of a stupid question, but speaking of what is entropy, because I was having also some conversation with some other mathematician friend who was like, this is basically like a configuration of the universe or something. It yeah, doesn't yeah, necessarily yeah. need to be Let this. Let me ask you this really quickly, quick. got one minute. Yeah, entropy, so then... So entropy is basically needs to be replaced, and Sarah and I are working on replacing it. Abhishek as well. Abhishek's like, what the hell are you guys doing? This is crazy. Oh no, it's not. Um, and basically, there are problems, right? If you believe, if you're determinist, so let's say we're all determinists, right? The initial conditions of the universe basically uh, give everything. Now this conversation doesn't really need to happen because we're already being determined by the universe. Well, clearly that's incorrect. Something else is going on. So then, so right now you have to have the initial conditions. You have to have um, uh, the emergence of time, the emergence of causation and the second law. All those you can get rid of with just one thing. You just need time. So if time is fundamental, then you don't need entropy, you just need assembly. So you need to find selection gives you gives you high assembly um, until you get to life forms. But you have to start somewhere. So time is not like maybe the only thing. Yeah, yeah, time, 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 <laughs> yeah, okay, sure, right, right, right. So, so basically you need a load of chemicals in a pot and some time. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. But then how, how many? Like if, if I knew the answer, like I would be saying that. Like, 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 like why? Because that has to become, um, if, if the probability of getting a life form is too, too tiny, that in um, in the lifetime of a, of a scientist... We actually have some information on that now. We know that probably it's going to be, we can make replicators, inorganic replicators, and ones that will start to mutate in the lab, right, the information. Once we do that, I think we're away to the races, and we'll get give you some bounds on that. Because that's a really good question. Say, so look, how much do you have to cheat to make a life form? Yeah. That is a question, and it's a really good question. Yeah, we certainly are cheating, right? There's no round bottom class to the origin of life. 
None of these pumps, no valves, right? No, no KDL, just a load of random stuff going on the planet. So exactly that's what we're trying to pin, to pin down. And do you have also conditions that are changing every day? In the yeah, yeah, yeah. That's the whole point, yeah. Everything is changing and recorded. Randomly changing. Um, it can be, my, I like random, my group don't. <laughs> Well, I have one question. Why, why is this the best method to figure out whether or not there is life? Like, it, why is that? Why this? Why not? It's cheaper than getting, building a spaceship and, or build, and going looking for other life form, right? It's cheaper. I think that NASA will go eventually and land on Europa, probably tight. It's going to tighten in a few years. So probably we'll know if there's other forms of life in the solar system and it would and what I'd, I'd like to go to the outer solar system, so I think if there's any life in the outer solar system, it's very unlikely because there's not enough energy, right? So this is the problem. The outer solar system, solar system will likely be dead because there's not enough stuff going on. But if we did find an origin of life, if we did find life in the outer solar system, I'm willing to bet it's completely different. Mm. The, the, you know, life on Earth is contingent to the Earth. There is no, there's no Earth, there's no Earth-based life anywhere else in the universe. That's it. Uh, I'm sorry that I'm so unknowledgeable about this, but basically... I mean, this, You're this unknowledgeable, is... you look at me, come on. No, 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 <laughs> hey, hey, come on. Uh, but I mean, this is such a big concept, like, uh, I have no idea about this, but like, this is basically like, we've been trying to do life or like, describe life or something as a like, empirical method thing, as opposed to a first principles thing, and you're trying to do the first principles thing. Yeah. But yeah, this yeah. is a huge deal, like... <laughs> I mean, the best way to get to molecular nanotechnology, I always make, I keep making fun of Eric Drexler about this, is to evolve evolve the, the, the machine, right? And if we could, and, and actually this is not making fun now, this is a serious question. If we could make life forms, if that make molecular machinery for evolution, we just have to set the fitness function to get the type of machinery we want, rather than using an SPM to position all the atoms. Set up the problem correctly and evolve the damn thing. And when it's doing, doing what you want, like, you know, make me a quantum dot. You know, if the object doesn't make a quantum dot, be a quantum dot fascist, kill it, right? <laughs> You're dead. No problem. Like, screw you. Right, next one. And then, and in the end, you'll have your life form making you quantum dots because that's what you select for. So I think it's a, uh, it's amazing how biology has built chemical nano machines. Right, you know, it's amazing. So that didn't happen by anything other than evolution. So let's try and do it again in a lab. Why do you work on chemistry and biology? Uh, because um. <laughs> um, I actually, I actually wanted to be a mathematician. I could I just, yeah. So I ended up being a chemist because that's the only, that's the only degree. Oh, do, do, that's all I could get. <laughs> Many years ago, I couldn't get it. Uh, I didn't go to biology because I thought biology was even more kind of outrageously um, irreproducible and nonsensical as chemistry. Biology is nowhere near as digital as we think. You know, the DNA, DNA code gives us a lot. You know. Craig Venter approved that when he made Cynthia, right? He took facsimile of his genome, put it into a cell, doesn't boot up unless you actually take a living cell that you then remove the genetic immaterial from. So there's something in cells, some literally non -genomic, genomically encoded chemical reaction that's required for life. I mean, holy shit, that's like, that's pretty interesting. So synthetic biologists today, in general, cannot um, get cells to self replicate unless you use it, something going back to Luther. That means everything that goes back to the origin of life now is, is so. So again, I'll, I'll become a biologist. Um, mm -hmm. I'm going through my mathematics training right now, and then then I'll finish my maths training, and then probably once I've finished doing some chemistry, I'll do some biology. But why why study human biology when you can make your own? No, not human biology, but like you no, I mean living the Earth biology. I mean, you, you know, why be human? Is to discover looking at biology exists. I, you know, I'm not a creationist, but I want to be one, right? Yeah, yeah but that, that's already invited by evolution. Let's, not, yeah. let's do it again. Let's go completely from scratch. Let's assume there's other ways of doing it. Anyway, I think okay. it's much done. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you so, so thank much. You. Thank you. Thank you.